Hi, my name is Nick Carver. My project is on the potential application of nitinol's shape memory for use in internal muscle repair. The current options for a skeletal muscle injury are muscle transplants, biomesh scaffolds, and cell regrowth therapy. Some of these options are very invasive and have a long recovery period, and all of these options rely on the body's own reconstructive response. This means that there are no current solutions to large skeletal muscle injuries other than amputation and a prosthetic. Although prosthetics have come a long way in utility, there is still a large loss of function and total loss of sensation with this option. So what is nitinol? Nitinol is a nickel titanium alloy that due to its almost exactly 50-50 composition has extremely interesting properties including super elasticity and shape memory. But why nitinol? Nitinol's shape memory and biocompatibility could make it uniquely capable for internal muscle replacement. Nitinol has a shape predetermined during manufacturing that when heat is applied, it will exert a force to return to that original shape. In this case, when heat is applied via electric current through the wire that makes it contract like a muscle. The heat necessary for nitinol to contract is called the transition temperature. Nitinol is also a biocompatible material already used in the body for a number of medical purposes. Some of these include cardiac stents and mesh cages for orthopedic surgery. Finally, its size and movement type is ideal for internal use. Most prosthetics use motors and actuators to create movement. While this is applicable outside the body, that much bulk and moving parts would never be able to function inside the body. A cluster of small nitinol wires could effectively replace a muscle group seamlessly. The testing layout for this research focused on replicating the bicep muscle group. The testing construct consisted of an analog elbow joint and tendons with the nitinol spring to be tested strung between the tendons. Masses were added to the end of the arm to simulate a weight the arm would have to lift. A mass was hung like the image on the right and an electric current was sent through the nitinol springs to heat and contract them. This process was repeated with increasing masses until the arm could not reach horizontal. The humerus of the joint is connected to the wood construct at points A and B. The wood is then clamped to the table to remove any unwanted movement from the construct. A few material choices had to be made regarding the testing setup for this research. The two main things for the construct were the analog elbow joint and tendon material. A left elbow joint from sawbones was chosen. Sawbones are widely used in the orthopedic industry for testing new products, so the joint is anatomically accurate with respect to its size and movement. This version also has a hard shell making it very solid and perfect for drilling. An accurate tendon analog was also necessary so that the force the nitinol produced would be transferred to the joint in a similar way to real muscle. PTFE rods were chosen since its elastic modulus is very similar to human tendons. They were then cut in half to make them the correct size and shape. For comparison, the elastic modulus of human tendons is 421.1 plus or minus 212 megapascals, and the elastic modulus of PTFE is 400 to 800 megapascals. An adjustment had to be made between trials when the weight being lifted got heavier. Due to the weight increase, the force was no longer applied to the elbow joint flexion and instead directly to the radius, pulling it vertically out of the joint. This also resulted in the radius rotating over the ulna, flipping the wrist. To combat this unwanted motion, tape was applied to the back of the joint and around the radius and ulna. Although changes mid-experiment are not ideal, it is reasonable to believe that this support change kept future trials more similar to the original than if no change was made. Four different wire types are tested in this research. Types A and B have wire sizes of 0.5 millimeters. Types C and D have wire sizes of 1 millimeter. Types A and C have mandrel sizes of 4.75 millimeters. Uh, and type B and D have mandrel sizes of 2.4 millimeters. The mandrel size of a spring is the inner diameter of that spring, and all four types have a transition temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. Each wire type will be tested along with both one or two strands. 
This experimental design allows for the evaluation of how wire and mandrel size affects the force output along with how well the force scales with increasing wire number. Both type A tests are complete and the one strand test for type D is completed. Transportation and power supply amperage are currently causing delays in testing. The type B wire was lost during transportation and is being reshipped. The power supplies available for my research only output 6 amps, which is not enough for two strand testing of types C and D. A second power supply is being located to help adapt the testing for these two wire types. Since an electric current is creating the heat necessary for contraction, the wires are in parallel and the length of the wire is constant. The diameter of the wire being tested is the only factor in the volts and amps required. This means that types A and B have the same resistivity of 2.02 ohms and the same circuit diagram, both requiring 5 volts 2.47 amps for one strand and 5 volts 5 amps for two strands. With a lower resistivity of 1 ohm, types C and D require 6 volts 6 amps to reach the same transition temperature with one strand. This means that two strands would require 6 volts and 12 amps if arranged in parallel. This is more amps than what can be provided by the power supplies available. To solve this, a double pole single throw DPST switch will be used to si simultaneously switch on two independent circuits with their own 6 volts 6 amp power supply. This will allow the full contraction of a two strand test of type C or D without a larger power supply. The data collected so far is insufficient to make any conclusions about how wire or mandrel size affects the max torque nitinol can overcome specifically. However, an increase in wire size along with a decrease in mandrel size saw a significant increase in max torque. Which factor had a larger effect is unknown without future tests. With the type A test, it appears that an increase in wire number will increase the max torque but again, future tests are necessary to draw this conclusion and fully understand the extent of change. The max torque of nitinol could over overcome was used as a measurement because of the multiple forces on the system. The radius and ulna by themselves has mass, and therefore, with no added weight, there is still a torque, T1, on the system at half of X's length. It would be inaccurate to measure the force produced by nitinol by solely looking at T2. By turning the grams added into torque, it creates a unified measurement to compare tests. Firstly, the rest of the tests need to be completed. Once all the tests are done, the torque numbers can be used to identify the force produced by each nitinol type and to also make a comparison to the bicep muscle group. Finally, the data will be analyzed and conclusions can be drawn about the effect of wire and mandrel size along with increasing spring numbers and the overall applicability of a nitinol as an internal muscle replacement.